Hi, Ian. Thanks for joining us today. So we're it's so good to see you. Good to see you. It's not like we see each other a little bit, right? Here, here and there. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for for joining us today. You know, like I, I'm I'm really really excited to chat with you a little bit about what we're gonna do in our future months and and everything that we are going to 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 go through it. But before, you know, I, I, I don't for, we have a lot of people joining us from all over the planet. Do you mind if, if I can make a little interview about where are you coming from? Or are you, who is he in there? Do you mind? No, let's go for it. <laughs> for it. Yeah. Ian, tell us a, a little bit. Uh, well, for everybody that is tuning in, this is my super boss. This is Ian Derrick. This is the general director of the Dallas Opera. Uh, Ian, where are you from? Well, I, I grew up in North Carolina, and uh, I, I was actually born in Illinois, but I didn't live there very long. My parents relocated to uh, a little little town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. So I grew up there uh, until I graduated from high school. And so I, I pretty much have a Southern upbringing, uh, even though my parents are both uh, very much Midwestern. So. Well, this, this is fascinating, because you know, I, I have to say that coming from, from outside the United States, uh, I I don't identify a lot like the opera uh, kind of culture to the Southern American culture. Like, is it is it very present that like you came in into into a, a a situation where opera was available to you? I I think it's pretty unusual. I think it's uh, opera in the South is certainly fairly young, though Atlanta uh, has a had a great tradition. Uh, a lot of the the Southern uh, cities got their exposure through Met tours. Uh, but one of the oldest opera companies, if not the oldest opera company in the United States is actually New Orleans, I believe. So uh, right there in the middle of the South. So uh, a great opera tradition that began there. Uh, French opera tradition, uh, believe it or not. But, you know, for me, it was uh, my, my parents uh, were very much involved with, with music as an, at an amateur level. Uh, both of them sang uh, in the opera chorus in uh, what was then the Charlotte Opera, uh, then became Opera Carolina later. But opera was always a big part of my house. My dad had a, a really big opera collection. And it was because he, he grew up uh, in, in Illinois. And one of his uncles was an opera fan because he had been stationed in Vienna uh, during kind of like during the war and after the war and ran a radio station and became really good friends apparently with George London uh, at that time. Casual. And so he, he brought over all of these recordings uh, that George London had, had made and, and a lot of stories. And so my dad inherited all these things uh, over the course of the years and he grew up listening to them and, and shared them with me too. So uh, the discography was certainly bass baritone friendly in my household, but uh, uh, it, it, it uh, really grew. And uh, I, I certainly grew up listening to the, the Met broadcasts uh, on the radio every Saturday. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, having opera in the house really uh, hooked me uh, very, very, very young. Uh, and also my parents singing in the opera chorus it was really uh, just kind of inevitable because it was always in the house one way or the other. Yeah. And they dragged me to rehearsals and, and I'd end up on stage in some uh, little children's super role somehow, some wow. way. And, and uh, it, it, just, it just happened. And uh, it was also kind of a, a beautiful way to grow up because as, things that I didn't realize until much later were that I was learning things about life uh, in, in an opera house that I just wouldn't have gotten any other other place. Um, I've said before, you know, you kind of grow up in an opera house and you realize that uh, opera teaches you that uh, it, uh, it is absolutely for everybody, uh, every color, every shape, every sexual preference. It's, uh, there, there's a place for everybody in the opera house. And that was uh, one of the things that I grew up with, you know, the kids that I was singing with, they were every color, they were black, Hispanic, uh, and I, it seemed rather normal to me. And there were women uh, conductors. I remember uh, women conductors in Charlotte, even in the uh, early 80s. 
and uh, certainly women directors and, and uh, stage managers, you know, taking control of the situation. So uh, women as leaders was never something that uh, even entered my mind as something unusual. Uh, so that's kind of where growing up in an opera company helped expand my horizons, I guess, in a lot of ways that were uh, able to shape uh, my, my, my future. Um, the, the love of singing though, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what was inherent in growing up in Charlotte was that I was very lucky to not only have parents that, that mm -hmm. noticed I liked it and encouraged it, but also, uh, there were a lot of people within the company there that, that took on to a mentoring role, uh, for me. And once they realized that I had an ear for, for opera and singing, uh, they, they took it upon themselves to make sure that I was only listening to the really, really, really good stuff. And uh, you had a couple of mentors, you know, that, that kind of show, show you the way and say, these are the recordings <laughs> you need to listen to. These, don't listen to this person past 1972, anything before, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's, and wow. I mean, you and I have plenty of uh, uh, memories of uh, being very, very, going down singer rabbit holes of, of fine fine-tuned things yeah. about what it what it what makes the singing so great but uh, it was, well, it, was that... a, it was a great way to grow up it, and and i guess surprising for a lot of people but the south also i mean you think of spoleto festival in charleston at that time uh, emmanuel was was a uh, uh, music director and i'd even I'd, I'd gone to things down there i didn't even know him uh, oh wow kind of amazing amazing stuff yeah it's so it's it's fascinating how this story, at least for 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 how your current team comes in and out. Like uh, especially, you have very mm -hmm. uh, a particular special relationships uh, at different times in different facets with a lot of your team. So that's and we we will touch in 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 a little bit. But I wanna you know you talk you talk about something that that the ones that we work with you we know a lot about it. But it's your incredible love for phenomenal singing that is so rare i'm sorry that it's it might sound like a a rare thing for a general director to have but i am inspired a lot of that that you rarely like compromise on a voice and at the same time you you have you have achieved uh, a very valiant like effort in your company to have incredible diversity too but but it seems that it comes just by the pure level of singing and the exposure of that so do you recommend in order to 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 achieve this kind of standard just get them young you know is that the formula <laughs> <laughs> for for great I, great taste <laughs> i i think so i think it's it, it it really it's it's what you're exposed to uh, initially and having somebody take a moment and say uh you really need to to really you know, when you when you're going to a city, well, not even now, but I mean, all right, 15 years ago, when you were going to a city for the first time and you wanted to go and make sure you went to the right restaurants, you would you would get somebody to make either recommendations or you refer to the Zagat guide. Yeah. And uh, I I had that all through my life growing up, and then I just developed my own taste. I mean, you're the same way. I mean, you and I. I mean, when we first, I mean, take take aside from the Chiari years. Uh, when we first started yeah. working together, it was just kind of like we were we were absolutely speaking the same language. You didn't have to talk. Yeah. We just yeah. yeah 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 yeah. Of course, good, good that, that person makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah, it's good singing. And I I don't know. I mean, there was always. I grew up listening to opera. Right. I mean, I I, I literally grew up listening to the the LPs with the record and the scratches and all that kind of stuff. And I would delve into the the librettos and read all the the things that were in the the record covers. And so I was training myself to respond orally, uh, and I would get goosebumps. And I, I knew that the, the recording was worth its merit if I got goosebumps. And so suddenly you become interested in not only what the studio recording were, was, but what was hap happening live. And so all of a sudden my record collection, which eventually became a CD collection, exploded into live recordings and, and going back and finding the, the teachers of the singers that I liked and seeing how all of that wow. uh, trans, transferred into uh, developing techniques. Um, but I still, I, I, I know, and I know you're, this, that you're that way too. I mean, there are performances that you go to and uh, if, if you get the goosebumps, you know you've done something right. And yeah. that's not only a matter of the, the way that anyone sings, but it's a matter of the way 
the energy is in the room and what's going on between the singer and the conductor. And, and it's, it, that's the magic. That's really the magic. I, I, I love it. You know, it's one of, one of the things uh, that, that you and I like bonded very well in our, in our work relationship it was that we both treasure great pipes and, and exactly that sensation of the goosebumps experience of that power or, or that finesse of, of achievement of, of kind of like there's achievement in filming for Oscars. There's the achievement in, 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 in technique, let's say of what a human voice can do. And, and we both have done it like, you know, we bond over, over that very well, but, but let me bring you back a little bit. You mentioned the, the Chiari year. So we're, we're getting a little ahead. You, you are, you know, you're in, you're in this incredible childhood with music and, and, and opera going. When, it, when is the, the moment would you say, you know, I'm, I'm going to become a pro at this. And I don't know if your first goal was to be a general director of a level one opera house eventually, but, but when was the first moment where like, I, this, is, this is how I'm going to pay my bills. This is my passion, but this is also my profession. Well, I, I remember, uh, wanting to sing and I, my parents said all right well we'll see if you can sing and and they they got me some voice mess lessons when i was a, a little kid and uh i think it was kind of right after my voice changed and uh it it seemed perfect for me to go into a, a boys choir so i went into the charlotte boys choir and sang there for uh, a number of years and then uh eventually another chorus and or uh, the oratorio charlotte oratorio youth mm -hmm. oratorio i think it was called um and so I was, I was slowly kind of uh, introducing myself to choral music, which I really, really loved. Um, but then I, I sang the little, little boy in, in Gianni Schicchi and Charlotte uh, Gerardino. And mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking, oh, this is really cool. So I, I remember being on stage and that, those first rehearsals and, and being terrified, and being terrified uh, that I was not going to uh, get my lines right or come in at the wrong time. Um, and that seemed really rewarding. I really enjoyed it and ended up being in children's chorus in Tosca and other things there and decided I, that's the route I wanted to go uh, after high school. And I auditioned for several uh, places and uh, I got a, a, a good deal, a good scholarship at Southern Methodist University. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brought me to Dallas for the absolute first time. And I studied there with uh, a man named Tommy Hayward, uh, who mm -hmm. was uh, an incredible teacher, uh, taught a lot of great singers, you know, uh, Cliff Forbes and Jay and, and, and uh, Nancy My Ellis, Don Ray, uh, all of My these. My teacher, sister, you are. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's right. Yeah. And, and I, I was one of Tommy's last students. Uh, he retired, I guess, after my, my sophomore year. And uh, he passed away shortly after that. And I ended up uh, staying at SMU, uh, obviously, and studied with uh, Richard Best for a year, then Virginia Dupuy for my final year. And, uh, but at the same time, I was also in, in uh, a work study program. And so I was working for uh, the opera program as uh, you know, kind of general whatever you need. And I ended up, um, uh, Dejan Milodinovich was the opera director at the time, and he's He's since passed away, uh, but he was a, a Serbian director and uh, a lot of fun and it, uh, very eccentric. But he also came to opera through a musical family. His father was a conductor. His mother was a mezzo-soprano. And uh, he, he opened my eyes to what it might be like to be a, a director, a stage director. And so I remember he said, well, we'll take an opera every few weeks and we'll study it together. And... Uh, I came, I, I remember meeting him for coffee one time and we, we I can't remember what opera was. It may, maybe it was Turandot, something like that. And uh, I brought my piano vocal score and he brought his full score. And he looked at me and he said, you need to bring a full score from now on. He said, that's the blueprint of the, the piece is the full score. So you're, you, you're getting a fraction of the elements if you're using the piano vocal score to, to, to see how you want to direct. And that's very rare for, for directors. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but, but it kind of taught me the appreciation of making sure that music was always the fundamental element in, in the directing and production aspect of it as well. 
uh, something I still believe today. So that, those were the early years. I ended up uh, getting a, an internship uh, in my, my last year at Dallas Opera, or, or last year at SMU, at, in, uh, the, in Dallas, at, at Dallas Opera. And I was an intern uh, on a production of Electra. And it, that was a game changer for me because the director then was John Copley. And uh, he, uh, oh boy, I was as green as, a, as grass at that point. I, was, I had n no idea what it was like to assist or be an intern for anything. This was absolutely on the production side. And uh, he, he, he read me up and down and uh, I, I learned very quickly what, how I needed to anticipate things. And wow. uh, ended up going from there to Santa Fe Opera in 1996 and then just going down uh, a full number of years uh, as, a, as an assistant stage manager, a stage manager, uh, an AD, uh, directing some along the way. Uh, but really uh, falling in love with the backstage side of, of opera production and, and uh, learning what it takes from the other side. So not only uh, growing up um, as, a, as a, a kid on the stage, but uh, thinking I was going to be a singer and then getting this other side of the curtain that was really, really incredible too. And then life got very complicated and I decided to go and get a, a master's degree in opera production at Northwestern. And that's where I met Mignon uh, Dunn and she was teaching there. And I, I sang in a, in a class there, uh, it was a German lead class. And wow. she heard me sing for the first, and it was actually uh, her, it's being taught by her husband. And she, her husband was out that day and so she was filling in for him and uh, I sang something and she said, well, where, where are you? Where are you? What are you studying? And, and I said, I'm studying directing. And she said, well, you can do that when you're old. You should be singing. <laughs> and so I, I kind of split for the next year and a half of having one foot in singing, one foot in directing. And, and uh, she ended up being uh, my last voice teacher. And uh, I, I, still, I still touch base with her and see her every time in New York. And, and oh. she's, she just turned 92, I think. Uh, but that's, that's where I met Mignon, and that's where I went to Chiari for the first time, and I met a young Mexican tenor named David Lomeli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, a lot of people don't know, but there was a moment where, where we both were lined up to sing Janice Kiki, you, uh, and Renucho. You were, like, at that moment when I remember it was my very first time outside of... Uh, I have been to Europe once, but I went to sing mariachi with my school, and um, yep. and uh, and and a little bit uh, before that, I I had a little bit of, of of training, but but not as in depth. And I and I arrived, and 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 it was so intimidating. You were so prepared, <laughs> so good, and you sound like a million bucks. And 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 as you said, like Mignon was there, and Bruno Regacci was there. And it was it was an incredible thing, like how how do we I don't think that we never ever expected when I went to get my schedule from you in 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 Chiari that 17 years uh, later we would be here, right? Uh, uh, no kidding, <laughs> so much has changed, and look what look what happened to you, my God. Well, we have we have had a little bit of a journey, but um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a little bit, but. Anyway, we are we are we are on, on discovering who is who is Ian Dara with with us a little bit and for the crowd of critical conversation that I want to say thank you again for I've seen a lot of people from Mexico, from Canada and from Europe joining in and our colleagues from Dallas Opera uh, friends like really thank you for tuning in. They are very, very kind to, to give us a little bit of time on Saturday. But um, anyway, Ian, like so you are. Uh, you're kind of now in the transition of leaving a little bit the the singing behind and you so you're you actually have a, a very good wealth of the stage management part of the stage director assistant directing directing yourself uh, can you tell us a little bit about that there's a method to my madness but just just tell me a little oh, bit about yeah. it <laughs> yeah yeah well i i ended up uh following minion to new york and i moved to new york in 2001 and I, I, I'm, I moved to New York 
three weeks before September 11th. Mm. And so I got there and then all of a sudden the world just completely changed, obviously. And I was studying with Mignon at Brooklyn College. And uh, so shout out to Brooklyn College. Um, that was uh, an incredible experience just because, I mean, again, you're going through something that is uh, un unlike anything you've ever experienced in your life, the world changes overnight. And that uh, was a, a degree program that I, I got a master's in voice and then I also got a master's in fine arts. And so I was uh, uh, really still splitting that world. I was singing some at Brooklyn College. I did, I did Skiki there. I did uh, Nick Shadow and Giovanni nice. and, and a, a, lot of, a lot of great fun stuff, um, but on the college level or, or graduate school level and ended up wanting to lean more into the production side. And I was really finding that uh, because I had had onstage experience, I had backstage experience, I had uh, worked in, in summer, I was continuing to work in Santa Fe in the summers for, for many years, uh, that it, administration was really seeming like a, a really in, natural fit because mm -hmm. uh, you were able to pull on all those different levers of experience. and. So my, my final semester, I think, at my MFA, I got a, an internship at um, Columbia Artists in New York, and I was working on the agent side. And I was interning, first of all, with uh, Ken Benson and Rob Scott and Michael Benjentritt. They had a, an office there. And, um, uh, this was the, the, uh, uh, the old, old Cami right across from uh, uh, Carnegie Hall. And that was wonderful and ended up, they, they offered me a job within a couple of months and I was working for Judy Janowski and uh, wow. uh, Mr. Wilford actually uh, for, for a little bit. And I, uh, I, I really, I learned a lot and it, I was, I was uh, working closely at that time, particularly with um, two people for Mr. Wilford one was uh, handling a lot of stuff for Andre Previn and the other was uh, Russ Rapovich. And just in, <laughs> just in America. Just, yeah, and it, was, it was unlike <laughs> anything I had ever seen. But wow. I tell you, it was, it was an, an educational experience. Uh, and I learned very wow. quickly that um, I, I belonged on the other side. I, 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 I understood what management was about and I understood how that was working, but I knew that I was being called to the opera house. And I had to you know, have, a, have a meeting with Miss, Mr. Wilford and to explain to him uh, that I was going back to the opera house. And I think uh, he, he actually wasn't surprised at all. He, he said, I think you're gonna make a lot less money at the opera house. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, he understood. And he, he understood that if you're, you're, you're pulled to uh, something, you have to go with it. So it, it really was uh, one of those moments that I, I treasure. And so I, I ended up going, switching my internship from there to New York City Opera. And uh, wow. City Opera at that time, uh, Paul Kellogg was the uh, general director, Robin Thompson was the artistic administrator. Uh, and uh, I was uh, fly on the wall, uh, assisting in the rehearsal department. And within a few months, there was some transition at that opera house. And they offered me uh, the position of uh, rehearsal and music coordinator. So I was uh, thrust into having to schedule uh, City Opera at that time, which was, I think, 16 operas in six months or something like, or four months. It was, it was an insane uh, thing, but God, was it fun. And, but when I look back on the, the cast of characters that, that was in the basement at the New York State Theater at that time, um, obviously, Robin was there. Michael Lonergan uh, was the uh, artistic planning. Uh, I think his title then was with planning, but he had done the scheduling before I did. He's now at, at uh, the Armory in uh, New York, uh, really, really doing a lot of the, the programming there. Incredible. Uh, Corey Lippiello is now at, at wow. uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago. Uh, in the education department was a young director named Yuval Sharon. Wow. Uh, and yeah, uh, and uh, Tim O'Leary was was there as an assistant wow. to Jane Gulong at the time. So I mean, it, it was it was a very very uh, incredibly inspiring time to be a part of of opera and and to see what happens from from there. 
And I left uh, City Opera in 2006 to start at Lyric Opera of Chicago, where I was for eight years. Uh, and that's where I met a whole lot of our, our friends, uh, Emmanuel yeah. and uh, uh, Lisa Bury. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's been a, 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 a circuitous path, but you know, it, I've been in an opera house all my life. <laughs> I, and, and you know, I, you, you have been in, around the business, you know, it's so, it's so fascinating because even talking to you right now and we are, we have been, uh, you know, space bodies like in six feet for the past almost six years intermittently, almost every day. And I didn't know a few things that you said today. So that was fascinating. Oh, you know, that, that, that's great. That's why we do these things. You always, you always somehow confess way more things to the Insta <laughs> in a, in a life. <laughs> uh, but, but tell me like, you, you know, you have been now at this point, you have been rehearsal that also part, for the ones that don't know, uh, my boss is like the king of schedules. Like he can schedule every single thing and it fits and it's amazing. It's something that I never dare to compete with you because you're like all of us when we are, when you're scheduling is it's a really an art form. So really uh, for the ones that know that's a, it's a fun fact about Ian Derer, like he can schedule <laughs> everything beautifully. Uh, but you have been, you know, in the agent side, you have been singing, you have been AD and you have been interning. You arrived to Lyric and you are also in, in production, right? You're, you're kind of, that's your trajectory yeah. in that department. Uh, but then yeah. in 2014, bum, 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 you, you went yeah. into the dark side and the dark arts of, of, of casting and director of artistic administration in Dallas Opera. How was that transition? Because, yeah. you know, you, you, were, you came into Chicago and then suddenly you are in a very different part of the, of the business too. Well, it, it was really exciting for me. I mean, I, I, uh, Chicago was uh, an incredibly influential time uh, of, mm -hmm. as far as uh, exposing me to different levels of expertise and uh, uh, really, really opening my mind to uh, the highest quality of, of planning and, and, and preparation and, and what, what is possible. And because uh, I, had, I had had a lot of experience doing opera uh, with very, very few resources and just relying on, on uh, a lot of grit and, and uh, love and passion to get you through. And uh, Chicago at that time was a, a different ball game. And people there uh, really, really took a lot of time to make sure that a lot of attention was placed to uh, proper preparation and planning. And the, the, the product yielded uh, incredible stuff, still does. Uh, and that's something that was just kind of built into where, what I wanted to do going forward, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I got there, uh, I was, very heavily in, in the production aspect. I, I became rehearsal administrator and then uh, director of production and uh, overseeing production staff uh, and uh, doing some work with uh, commissions beginning, beginning uh, and mm -hmm. we were uh, in the beginning stages of the, the ring cycle that has just now sadly come, come to a, uh, a tragic end for, for them. But at the same time, I always loved singing and, and uh, I, I, I found that many of my uh, relationships with the singers grew and grew and grew in the course. I don't know, I had an office down right in the heart of the um, rehearsal department in Chicago. And yeah. speaking of confessionals, it seemed like my office always had <laughs> was the confession booth. And so singers would come in and off stage yeah. and, 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 yeah. and flop in my office and we'd have to talk through whatever went well or what or how yeah. the relationship with the colleagues are going, the conductor, this, that, and the other. And uh, so that always remained very near and dear to my heart. Um, and so the, the opportunity to apply for the job in Dallas came, came up and I thought, well, you know, I, I, I have artistic chops. I know uh, it may not, I don't have a, a track record proven uh, in casting, but I'll, I'll give it a go. And it all worked out. And uh, Emmanuel had just uh, started as his music director. And let me tell you, uh, he and I had had, had uh, multiple shows in Chicago and Santa Fe by that point yeah. as well. So I, I just, it, it was like a match made in heaven just to be able to work with him. And then, you know, you come in and the, the, the three of us formed this, this uh, trilogy of uh, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And so I really enjoyed the artistic administrative side of it because it got to complement both those things. You could uh, rely on the, the meticulous things that, that I liked doing when I was a stage manager or AD, uh, but also uh, have the, the creativity to think outside the box and, and as far as uh, casting and everything. I, I think one of the first things that I got to cast uh, was the 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 Carmen and the the turn of well, that was the turn of the screw, and that was that was that was, yeah. that was that was so much fun to be able to to build that cast together and, and yeah so no and also like I remember you you came back from a trip from Glyndebourne uh, where you were so excited about this mezzo that you just heard. Uh, and and when Stephanie Dostrak came for the very first rehearsal, I was like, "Whoa, oh my God!" <laughs> you know, for that oh, Carmen, it was, it was so good. And 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 yeah, that cast like where where you came to. I remember that day when you came. We had several names for for the governess, and and you came with Emma Bell, and we all looked like, of course, like yeah, right. Like it was just uh, or Dolora. Remember, like that was amazing too. Oh you know? yeah. No, yeah, just, that was her first first time to do it too. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was it was great. It was great. And then you know we're go we're coming to the part where I want to start asking you a little more questions about the general director chair, because then you know you do it two years that it, for a lot of people you know your your kind of direct predecessor Jonathan Bell was there thirty years in that chair similar chair right. And, and yeah. our, a lot of our colleagues have been there. I think now uh, Greg has been in San Francisco 10 plus, Andy, I think almost 20 too, like something like that around. And, and Jonathan Friend is, no, uh, not the 20, 18, 15. Yeah, it's, 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 it's under 20, under 20. Under 20, right? But it's above 15 yeah. because it's more yeah. than Greg, right? I, so I, I, I was, uh, again, it's an incredible achievement. You know, I'm not saying that it's not nothing against them at all. I just like you were like, you know what? Uh, I'm going into the general director chair. I'm going to start throwing my ha my 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 card there, and uh, it's a special calling. Like what what when you said, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and it happened. Like what did you wanted to do? What there was something that you said like when I I'm general director, I want to do, boom. You know it. I think it, it came because, you know, if I, if I, if I ask my mother this, she, she will say, you knew you wanted to be a general director from the time you were 12. <laughs> uh, and she'll say something along the lines of me being a control freak, all these things. <laughs> and I don't remember it that way, but I'm sure, I'm sure there's a, a degree of truth in it, mom. Um, but I, I also, I also know that, that over the course of, of, you know, just growing up people, had said to me, have you ever thought about being a general director? And I, I, I would say maybe, but I, I don't think that I, I don't think I have enough experience. I certainly don't have a lot of experience in uh, the other elements of, of uh, opera making, you know, development and marketing. Um, but at some point in 2016, uh, there was this opening in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, a Kentucky opera for uh, general director after uh, David Roth had tragically passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of people encouraged me to apply for it. And I thought, okay, well, we'll just see. And I, I went there uh, to Louisville and, and had a, a, a great uh, interview. And, and there's some incredible people in Louisville, Kentucky. And there were a it's, it's a much smaller budget company than, than Dallas or, or, or Chicago, or, but, but there's such heart there and, and uh, a, a great tradition. And I, I felt like I really could pull together a lot of things, again, from various sides of my experience. And I said to the board that, you know, I, I have some big holes in my resume. I mean, I, I don't have a track record of fundraising. I don't have a track record of in, in marketing, but uh, if you're willing to help me along the way and acknowledge that, the other side's pretty good. Uh, you, I, I, the casting, the production, all of that kind of stuff, I, I know that we can make headway on that. And it really, uh, it, was, it was one of those things to, to try uh, that on a, on, at that company at that time was just right for me. 
And uh, I, I still uh, maintain some really great relationships with people there. Uh, I am so excited about what Barbara's doing. Uh, she really is uh, taking uh, such great, great chances. And, and even in spite of all the, the, the hell that the pandemic is, is uh, wreaking on, on all of us in the performing arts, uh, being brave and trying new things. That, that town is uh, really adventurous. Uh, it, it is a, there's the Actors Theater there, uh, which has an incredible tradition. Uh, so people love theater. And we did uh, my first season there that I programmed was um, Ariadne and uh, Dead Man Walking and uh, Barbara of Seville. And we got incredible cast. I mean, Christine Brewer came and did Ariadne and, and she sounded yeah. amazing. And, and <laughs> Garrett Sorensen and, and uh, Elizabeth Batten live in, in Louisville and they, they sang it and it was spectacular. And Dead Man Walking uh, was an incredible success for the, for the company there. And I, I think I, I programmed it because I knew that it was going to be important to the theatrical roots of the city as well. And, and, it, and it really, uh, I think it was one of the, the highlights for a lot of people that certainly didn't know what to expect and, and yeah. uh, uh, the movie, but not, not what opera could do at that level too. So that was very important. Um, but it was also an opportunity to kind of uh, open up uh, community and civic connections. And that's something that has always been in the back of my mind of, of trying to connect uh, the opera to what's going on in, in your, your own community. And so when I left, uh, so fast forward to 2018 and uh, the opportunity arose for me to uh, throw my hat in the ring for general director at Dallas Opera. Um, I didn't hesitate. I mean, I, I, I loved Dallas bum, bum, and bum. to be able to come yeah. back. I know, I know. It was, it was, uh, there was not much hesitation. And, uh, but at the same time, I, I knew that uh, being a general director at, in a level one opera company has a, a, a lot of challenges associated with it. So I, I, I took the risk and, and, it, and it paid off. But I also knew I was, uh, had the opportunity to go to a company where I absolutely knew what the artistic standards were with uh, Emmanuel and you uh, already just still there, still being a foundational rock of that. Um, so it, it, it made it a, a very easy decision to come back. Well, that, that's, that, that's amazing. That, that, that's a really incredible journey and, and a very, you know, like a, a, a life of service to the art form. So I am, I'm, I'm very, it's always a pleasure you know, to, to see that and how you plan and what you do. Uh, but now, you know, like, so you're 2018, of course, we had a lot of, you know, a lot of transition year blues, blah, blah, blah. But I think that in 1920, we started specifically with an, a beautiful magic flute. We were like rolling. We were, had so many incredible plans for, for the debut of Pretty Yende and, and having Larry's concert. And then the pandemic hits. Uh, and and tell me a little bit like you know uh, for a, we're trying to bring a lot into the network you know like a lot of kind of like the the realness of the process that we do a little bit of behind the scenes you know talk about what what it goes yeah. like when when we I remember sitting in you came to my office I was coming r like running up to check something because we had the Heart Institute of uh, Alumni downstairs uh, doing mm -hmm. a reading with Emmanuel and new prospect donors. It was an incredible event, uh, very new. We, I, we were so excited. And then we get this, this email that notifies us that, that we are, you know, kind of like suddenly COVID has come to us, you know, to, it has knocked the door of the Dallas Opera. Uh, we reacted very fast, I would have to say, you know, like we were like, Boom, we we close, we protected, and w w what does it go in in the mind of of, of the decision caller, you know? Because I can't imagine how stressed you have been since, but like those three, four, five days that you felt like immediately click. How, how was your response? Like, what do I do? How do you control the panic? How is that leadership brain that starts to like slow down things? <laughs> well. The, the interesting thing, so I, I have, I have a degree in 
in singing. I have a degree in business. I have a master's. I have three masters. <laughs> Nobody ever talked about <laughs> what the hell to do in a pandemic. I mean, so so there, there's no degree for it. Yeah. I don't know anybody that has really a lot of experience in this. So um, yeah. it it was it was terrifying. And and we had our what what our situation was was there was a uh, there was a, a an individual that was may have been exposed to a case that was a, a, a contact of a contact of a contact and it wasn't even confirmed. Yeah, yeah. So there was a there was there was nothing and 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 it was just the risk, right? And we I mean the first thing you think about is is safety and you think about risk. The other thing that I always go back to and and you've heard me say this numerous times and, and I'm mm -hmm. sorry to sound like a broken record, but yeah. the, the most valuable commodity that you can have is time. And what I wanted to do was to make sure that we had enough time to make the best decisions possible. And so the when you think in just terms of you need more time to make better decisions, it was a no brainer to shut things down and uh, make sure that we could assess the situation as best as possible yeah. before we did anything more. And that was, that was what we did. And it was uh, mainly uh, the fact that I didn't want to put anybody at, at, at risk uh, in any way, shape or form because we didn't know enough. We still don't know enough. We know a hell of a lot more, but we still yeah. don't know enough. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was, uh, it, I had to dis distill it down because at that point, David, there, as you know, there's so many things when you've got, we had the Heart Institute going, we had a, a, all of Don Carlo up and ready to go. We had, we were about to start rehearsals for, uh, the double bill. So everything was, was, you know, all systems go. And yeah. to think about each of those things as, as an individual thing to deal with is, is yeah. too complex. You have to go to the, the bare are the, are the most essential elements and to me that was safety i th that that was i i'm glad you you mentioned it because i think that you know now um there's so many opinions about how to go about this you know like there's a need of course for all the creative brains not only the artists but all ourselves you know for us that we are in management uh we are having the cast of Don Carlo in our heads for years in advance or, or the sets of Diving Bell in, 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 in front of us or, or the libretto, like all these things, like it's, it, we care. And, and, and as uh, Mr. Wilford said, like, you know, like we possibly sometimes sacrifice our financial expectations because we love this. We, it's, it's a creative product also for management. We go into it, uh, but safety, you know, like what, what is, your thoughts like of, of how is it is it real what we're seeing in Europe like I, I, I you know like we are an international opera house so we have to co-produce and cast and be informed about how, how, what is happening in Europe but Europe is starting to do a lot of performances um, with a lot mm -hmm. of distance a lot of things some of them very successful some of them not what what are your thoughts so like when you're at the helm at, at this mammoth that is a Dallas opera like you of course cannot just only think as a fan or as a manager or as like there's so many holistic things that you have to take in account what what is your thing is is it still is like we have to do safety or are we going the way for example the nba and the mlb uh, in baseball are doing that they're going to come back but they're going to close the doors they're going to try to sell a lot of tv rights but then every player has to sign a waiver that if they COVID, they cannot sue you know the mm -hmm. nba or something like that I don't see like I don't know what are, what are your thoughts of all these possibilities uh, as as fast as it can you know I know that there's a lot of things but safety seems to be also something that you and I discuss a lot what what are you feeling in general about this Well I think what's not entirely clear to me uh mm -hmm. yet and and that's partially because the landscape keeps changing but also because it's it's hard to keep up with it uh, what are the standards of uh, precautions and safety precautions being employed in Europe for them to be able to employ these things versus what we might have to be dealing with here in the United States? So uh, it's not only guidelines from the CDC, it's, it's the, the local and, and uh, the, the jurisdiction uh, things that we have to deal with in, in Dallas and Texas. Uh, but then also you have 
you have to take into consideration the safety guidelines that are going to be uh, part of the rehearsal process from all of our collective bargaining units with IATSE and, and AGMA and AFM as well. They, they have, they're looking out for their, their members. And at some point you have to figure out how to produce art in a way that, that all of those guidelines uh, can come together and, and overlap in a way that you can still do that and, and follow all the guidelines. That's very complex for opera. Uh, opera, as uh, Michael Bronson, who is a, a, a wonderful uh, consultant and used to uh, an incredible career himself, has a very famous quote, uh, which I will give it to him and, and use many times over. And that is, opera is a problem. And it is. It is. I mean, it's so complex. It is so complex. Yeah. So safety to me uh, is, is one of those things that you have to figure out, um, you know, from from in Europe, what, what's going on there, how much of that could apply to what we are going to try to do in the United States. And what does that look like? I think safety uh, downstage of the proscenium, a meaning for your audience members, your donors, uh, all of those folks that are coming to see something is probably the easiest thing to envision uh, how it would work based on social distancing guidelines, uh, meaning Right now, we'd have to have at least six feet. You'd have to have you know, seats in between all of these things. You'd have reduced capacity. You'd have to have uh, timed entrances and, and all of these things to contend with. That's far easier to comprehend than how you produce opera uh, because of the proximity of the nature of, of who's, who's in the pit, how many people can be in the pit safely. Yeah. Can you expand the pit? Can you raise the pit? Uh, how many choristers you know, could be involved in this production? Uh, how do you create uh, some degree of, of believability in an opera story if you can't come together uh, in, a, in, in a love scene, for example, and you have to remain socially distant? So there are an infinite number of challenges that you have to overcome with that. But at the end of the day, safety uh, right now is something that I think uh, we're, all, we're all seeing now, uh, particularly in Texas and, and in Florida, this uh, this increase. And so people are now wearing masks uh, and a lot more frequency with a lot more uh, uh, confidence in, in them being able to hamper uh, the spread of the virus. Yeah. Uh, a mask and opera singing don't necessarily go along <laughs> together either. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an infinite number of challenges that we have to face. Uh, but to go back to safety just for a second. So you've mm -hmm. got the element of the people that are watching, you've got the element of the people that are, are performing and that's the stage hands too and, and everybody that's working backstage dressers. Thank you. Then you add to that the, the elements of, of the safety in our own office. Uh, what is it, what's, what degree of safety? And at some point you, you should be employing the same degree of safety for everybody. Everybody's life is valued the same. And therefore, we have to figure out a way to, uh, to do this. The biggest question is, is what's it going to look like? And are you going to draw the line somewhere and say, we don't think that whatever we're able to create right now is so far off the bat from what we think it really should be that we're just going to pause and we're going to come back to this in another yeah. time. Or uh, we're going to do something daring and uh, more adventurous and, and uh, more controversial, maybe. And... Uh, I think that's part of what's happening right now in the digital world is that we're seeing this explosion of, of creativity and people trying to be daring to try something new. And I applaud all of that. I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, the safest way for us to engage right now is via Instagram. I, I, I think so. I, you know, it, it, it creates a lot of things. I think that, that Instagram on, on, and Facebook uh, at least these past three months through, through you know, like with all the efforts that we're doing at, at Dallas Opera, I found that we, that we connect with our audiences in a very, in a deeper way sometimes, you know, we, we always had that, you know, incredible experience of going to the live performance, maybe meet the live performers, have, if you are into a certain donor level, or maybe if you are being prospect-ish into something, you experience a little more kind of face-to-face -face management. But but TDO Network, I feel that that right now it has created a space to being a fan, in all the sense of the world. You know, you can be passionate, you can be a person, you can bring social 
issues into the art form and discussing within the margins of the art form and how it affects when the art form interacts outside. So it's, it's a, it, I think that it's, it's a very, very beautiful part that, that has sped up the, the, the involvement of opera into that aspect. Do you see that the, the, that now when, if like, you know, I hope that we go into a place where the pandemic is no longer pandemic and it's controlled and it's eradicated and we can do like business as usual, but do you foresee that the digital realm is here to stay into an art so complicated as opera? I, I think it has to be. And uh, well, I mean, we, we were uh, dipping our toes into it before yeah. the pandemic and because of your brainchild, your creativity, and your enthusiasm, <laughs> we went we went full full on, oh. and obviously the results are pretty good. Um, the <laughs> yeah. the the thing the thing about that is that we have to now find a way to make sure that the digital product stays with us and it enhances the live product. Yeah. So one of the things that I think uh, is happening is that we're finding out that people do want to tune in maybe at their own uh, convenience uh, yeah. to see more about the things that are going to be coming up on the live live stage. And yeah. uh, there's hunger for interaction with uh, the, the people of the company. Uh, there's hunger for interaction of the, the stars that are coming to participate. Yeah. And we have a natural stage now that, that can travel uh, and be a part of that live experience. So our job, I think, is to, to continue to build the anticipation and the, the, the hope to get back to the live performance in a way that the digital product continues to enhance that in the before and the after and the during. And that's, that's something that I, I, I think that everybody now uh, that has not been able to go to live theater, not been able to go to uh, orchestra concerts and mm -hmm. uh, operas, uh, I mean, we're all ready to be back and experience the real thing uh, in a way that gives us goosebumps. And that is something that I think is only going to continue to grow until we get there. Um, the, the digital product, I think, is, uh, you know, I, I just think it has to be along for the ride. So I mean, you, you, have, you have used it through your own creative ideas and, and uh, programming that you've helped design. Uh, to, to really draw attention from new people to what we're doing, uh, but not only for Dallas Opera, but the art form as well. And uh, I think that those are people that are really going to be drawn to seeing what we can do. If we've got people that can't experience opera live in Dallas, but we can, mm -hmm. we can show them and tantalize them uh, in, in our programming before and after, that's, that's worth a lot too, because we're still building fans. I, I, I think that that's, that's, you know, you nail it. Like it's, we have to create programming, everything, like every effort to, to, I really, I really enjoy the aspect or my favorite aspect. And I have discussed thoroughly a lot with, with, um, uh, with Lisa Burry that is tuning in today, our, our head of strategy uh, too. It's, it's having this arena of experience fandom in a way that, you know, demystifies a lot the way that opera can be seen, but allows the people to be who they are. And that ties into what message that you were saying, you know, an all, an all inclusive space. And, and we have like four minutes before we, we have to turn out. So you're going to have to come back and I know where to find you. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but you know, like now, something important is happening where the institutions of opera too are are kind of forced to also address social issues and i and i want to raise one and i'm and it's also because you're here you know like during ian's tenure uh the the senior staff of the dallas opera not only diversifying gender but diversify in ethnicity you have put now two people uh of of different minority like come back uh, backgrounds into positions of, uh, of real realistic trajectory of leadership overall. And that is, that is, we cannot thank you. The minorities in this business cannot think that is a really, really brave step, you know? And it's not only because we can be good in our job, it's a big step in the America of today. And, uh, and, and also the support that you throw to the Hart Institute of Women Conductors, not only in making it, but like on sustaining them employable and making this an issue with the brand and the, the brand and the support of the Dallas Opera. 
So do you think that in your tenure, besides everything, like, is it, is it something because who you are or it's something that an institution now has to think also part of the business model? You cannot address or survive in a company today professionally that has interaction of services, audience interaction, civic impact, and not address the, the social like problems that are, are from our chair. It's, how do you feel about it? This is changing now, no? especially in pandemic, I feel that there's a shift where we were priced to be less involved and now we're kind of pushed to be more vocal about everything. They Two, I, I know we're, we're short on yeah, time. Yeah, we're short, I, I know, but. I, or I, not short on time, I've been long-winded. Uh, <laughs> my title has two, I actually have two titles, general director yeah. and CEO. The general director part, you know, is, is the easier product-oriented things. The CEO thing, the CEO title is the one that, that is forcing me to deal with the business aspect of the company. And as CEO, you have a certain degree of responsibility that, is, that hits every single department, every single individual. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is that as, first of all, I'm incredibly proud of the decisions that we've taken, and I'm incredibly proud of the people in the positions that they are, and that includes you and Christian, uh, absolutely, without, without question. Yeah. What I am saying now is that as good as that is, it's not enough. And... The, the reality is, is that we need to do more. Uh, we, can, mm -hmm. we can and should do more as a company, uh, as an art form that goes without saying. And I think that, you know, this is a, a time, David, where mm -hmm. I, as a leader of a company, I am a, I'm a white man and I need to be listening more than I'm talking. And that is exactly uh, kind of the way I want to go forward. I want to listen more than I'm talking right now. And I, I think that the actions are, are much more important than listening to me talk about these things. My friend and boss, thank you. Like this, this is exactly this is, is, is listening. You're empowering. You have uh, really thank you for everybody that has been here uh, involved on TDO Network for your support, for, for the way that you throw into these projects. We receive, you know, you see it today. We have, 400 plus people from all over the world. And and uh, and I'm sure you're gonna get more and more fans now uh, hitting all your public channels. Um, I hope that you can come back again because I think that we, we can keep chatting about, I wanna chat about what we're gonna do programming, what are we, what are our thoughts about singing in more in depth. So I hope you accept our invite soon. I know your schedule is pretty tough, but uh, I'm, I'm making you hear everybody seeing, I did invite him. <laughs> uh, and uh, and thank you for inviting me, Debbie. No, 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 fantastic. And you know, just to run so uh, Instagram doesn't cut us really fast. But uh, uh, again, thank you for everybody that tuned on. I got an incredible board and all the people in the controls. Thank you for uh, uh, the team of TDO Network, Precise, Carolyn Walker, and Annie Penner that are in the joysticks. Thank you very much again for all your hard work. I see you next Saturday on Creative Conversations. This is David Lomeli and incredible Ian Derer for the Dallas Opera at TDO Network. See you next weekend. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.